I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to the Bigfoot Breakdown. We're going to talk about a story that we've referenced quite a number of times on other shows. Um, it's the, the account by Larry Batson, the Bob Titmus story. And it's kind of an interesting one, I think, because, well... Let's just get in it and we'll discover why it's interesting. Um, I know we interviewed Larry Batson on Creek Devil some time ago. And of course, he's passed on now. But um, And I don't remember what year he told me he talked to Bob Titmus, where, where Titmus relayed this story to him. Oh, you know what? Well, it may be in here. Let me just, let me just get into this. Um, he says, in the last years of Bob Titmus's life, I occasionally talked to him on the phone when he was up to it. Um, now, Titmus was in bad health. Even when I knew him, uh, he wasn't in very good health. He had heart problems. So, um, And being older, he, he just wasn't in great shape. So I can see why, you know, when he was up to it, to talk to him. Um, so he says, one day he told me about being up in the Bluff Creek area tracking Bigfoot, collecting hair samples, looking for footprints or whatever he could find. He related this incident, which occurred about a year or two before the Patterson-Gimlin footage had been filmed. Uh, Titmus was sure his memory was starting to fail him, but, but this event he remembered perfectly. Um, you know, when I, when I knew Titmus, to me it seemed like his memory was pretty good, so I'm not sure what he meant by his you know, memory failing him. He seemed to be pretty sharp. Um, so it's interesting now, you've got to remember, well, like he said, this was, this was before so this was probably around 1965 because the Patterson filming was October 67. Right. Um, he was deep in the back country of Bluff Creek by himself one afternoon. At that time, he was certain there was a Sasquatch or Sasquatches very close by uh, the evidence he was by the evidence he was finding. He was so involved and so focused that he lost track of the time and the sun was starting to go down. The density of the forest overcame him. Suddenly, he realized that the day was getting too dark to find his way back to his main campsite. Titmus realized that he was going to have to stay put until morning because trying to find his way out in the darkness would be dangerous and foolish. And I can tell you, I spent a lot of time in that country, and, and that's correct. Uh, if you were in there after dark, you know, and I'm, I'm not sure what he had, he probably didn't have any flashlight or anything with him. Uh, you'd, you'd hurt yourself trying to get out of there. Yeah let alone finding the right direction. So he said the nights can be quite cold, and, and he really was not wearing enough clothing to just lie in the woods and try to sleep. So he began to dig a pit uh, for him to sleep in. After he finished digging this bed and he had laid in it, he started covering himself with a thick layer of leaves, branches, and pine needles. After he finished, the only part of him that was exposed was a small area around his face. He was quite comfortable, sufficiently warm enough, to, and he had no problem going to sleep. Uh, let me go here. Let's see. Titmus guessed that the time was probably about 1 a.m. when he was startled awake by the sound of something moving through the forest nearby. And it seemed to him, from the sounds, uh, to be heading in his direction. He could hear the sound of heavy footsteps crashing methodically through the forest brush, breaking limbs and so forth. At first he thought that it was a bear... But it wasn't long before he realized it was too noisy for a bear. It came closer and closer. Then it stopped. Titmus could hear the thing breathing. Not just breathing, but also sniffing the air like it was trying to pick up a scent. And now he realized that he had needed... <coughs> oh. And now he realized that it had indeed picked up his scent, but could no longer... But could not figure out where he was. So it picked up his scent, but it didn't know where he was. Yeah. Make sure I made that clear because my reading wasn't very good. Uh, with just his face exposed, Titmus was very well concealed from what ha he had come to understand to be a Sasquatch. All of a sudden, it had started screaming, breaking branches and throwing rocks in his direction. Titmus held very still, very quiet. 
The Sasquatch started moving around, pacing back and forth through the forest, continuing to scream, bellow, and throw debris. Sounds very much like a gorilla, you know, throwing a tantrum. Yeah, and it's also commonly reported that they do that around uh, camping sites. Oh, yes. Um, Titmus related that this behavior continued on until about an hour before daybreak, which is when we know they head off to their bedding areas. Um, then as the sun began to rise and light trickled through the forest canopy, the creature went away and the forest fell silent again. He pulled himself out of his makeshift bed in the ground and started to look around investigating the entire area. He walked in the direction of where all the ruckus had came from and could not believe his eyes. Uh, it looked like a bulldozer had gone through the forest. Saplings had been pulled out of the ground. Larger trees pushed over, broken or snapped in two. Now, there's some elements in there that we, that we know about and seen. Saplings had been pulled out of the ground. I have photographs of this. Uh, from Yakult and other places. Um, talks about trees being pushed over, larger trees being pushed over. We've heard of this. Yeah. Uh, and then trees being broken or snapped in two. Lots of pictures of that. Yep. It says there were branches covered with hair samples and the ground was littered with footprints. It was no bear. In years late, or in later years, Titmus went back to Bluff Creek shortly after the Patterson footage. He went there actually ten days after the uh, the footage was taken by Patterson and actually tracked the creature and, and cast a bunch of the footprints. Um, he says, "Yeah, in later years, Titmus went back to Bluff Creek shortly after the Patterson footage had been filmed in October '67. He saw the footprints on the sandbar of the film subject had left." and he was certain that it was the same Sasquatch he encountered the night he slept in the pit in the wilds of Bluff Creek. And he the ends, the, the ends the story here by saying, a key figure in the Sasquatch Bigfoot investigation for nearly 40 years, Titmus died in Chilliwack, British Columbia, July 1st, 1997, following a heart attack he suffered a few days before in his home in Harrison Hot Springs, British Columbia. He was 78. Well, what do you think of that story? I think it was probably for him very terrifying. Could you imagine being exposed like that with nothing, nothing on top of you but pine needles and branches and you hear this thing feet away, tearing up the forest, screaming, hollering, throwing rocks at you? You know, it's got to make me wonder now, you know, with all of that behavior, now it was it was going through the brush, picked up his scent, couldn't find him, but then through this huge fit, now apparently there was no, um, there was nothing to precipitate that kind of behavior. So right. you have to ask yourself, what would ha what it would have happened to Titmus had it actually found him? Well, it knew what general direction he was in if it was throwing rocks over there. Yeah, I'm so. sure. If, depending on the airflow, it must have, you know, picked up a direction. And I'm sure a lot of times when, when hunting deer and other things you know during those hours of the night and it's interesting when around 1 a.m when a lot of activity we know we've you know picked up in the field in fact recently and from other people you know one two o'clock in the morning seems to be sort of that magical time period right but um you know now, whenever they found the tracks yeah they they com he compared the tracks to determine it was Patty that had done all that, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. And that's something people should understand, that Sasquatch tracks are, are like fingerprints. You know, no two are the same. No two creatures have the same, you know, foot impressions. You can clearly identify individuals by their feet. Right. Um, and that's, and you know, from wear patterns and things like that. Not just size and all that, but, uh, you know, different wear patterns and stuff. So it's interesting to note that just a year or two before Patterson got the film footage, the same creature was in the area, and that and you have to you almost you have to connect the two really, uh, you know, comparing the behavior from the Titmus story to yeah. what happened with Patterson and Gimlin. That's yep. why I kind of think sometimes you know it wasn't it wasn't some shy creature. This thing threw this horrible fit i mean you, you can only imagine what would have happened to titmus had he not been in a in a concealed position like that if he'd been out there 
and encountered this creature, it probably would have torn him up. Yeah. Um, so what was going on other than, you know, the fact that there were two guys with Patterson and Gimlin, they had the horses, they had rifles, and of course, you know, the camera in Patterson's hands, the creature wouldn't have distinguished that from anything other than a weapon. Yeah. Did they say if they ever did anything with the hair samples, do you know, that were found? He didn't. He, they didn't know. And that's okay. the thing. I mean, I, I knew other people like Renee Hinden that had hair samples, and they didn't do anything with them. So as far as we know, that stuff was all, if, if he collected it. And they didn't say in there if he actually collected anything. And I didn't ask Larry Batson when I talked to him either if, if he knew if Bob collected that stuff. And I've been to Bob Titmus's house. I mean, I knew Bob. So uh, Bob wasn't a storyteller. You know, if he relayed this, it happened. Yeah. Well, everything fits with how they react when people are in their areas or close to places they hang out in a lot. Absolutely, yeah. It's uh, very interesting, I thought. Well, what's your what's your consensus on this one? I think it's a legit story. I think he got very lucky that night that she didn't spot him because if she had, I don't think he would have been been able to get out and tell a story. Yeah, I have to agree. So I guess we'll put it in your hands, folks. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then... <laughs>